Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Club Metaverse podcast. I'm Mark Fernandez, and I'm very, very lucky today to be joined by Dr. Avi Loeb. Doctor, how are you today, sir? I'm doing great, and it's a great pleasure to speak with your avatar. And that's my first interview in the Metaverse. Okay, <laughs> great, great. So welcome to the Metaverse, and, um, you know, welcome to the show. And, you know, I just want to jump right into it. I've, 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 I've had the best time the last week uh, reading um, your, uh, your uh, latest uh, book, um, that covers extra, extraterrestrial life and Oumuamua and all of these, uh, you know, like amazing um, thoughts that you went on your journey cataloging this incredible, uh, you know, anomaly that sped through our solar system. And then we'll get all into that. But um, I, I'm very intrigued because I believe it's valuable to our younger audience about how you started um, your life of science and what were those hallmarks in your upbringing that gave you the the confidence to know this is where my life um, trajectory leads? Right. So I was born on a farm. I used to collect eggs every afternoon and uh, I was very connected to nature, less so to people. Uh, and uh, I used to read philosophy books. I was intrigued by the most fundamental questions. And then uh, circumstances brought me into physics and later on into astrophysics, studying the universe. And um, I, you know, I was never interested uh, in aliens or uh, extraterrestrial life, except that uh, there was this object discovered in 2017. And I addressed uh, the anomalies that it exhibited in the same way that I addressed the nature of matter in the universe, or how did the universe start, or what is a black hole? You know, these are questions I worked on over the years, uh, and uh, I approached this object the same way, and that brought me into this uh, subject. And I should say that, you know, my connection to nature is pretty much uh, evident in the way I conduct my science today because I care less about how many likes I get on Twitter. <laughs> uh, and uh, I remember as a kid, I used to ask a difficult question at the dinner table and the adults in the room would dismiss the question simply because they didn't know the answer. Sure. And I thought that by becoming a scientist, I will uh, actually be able to answer questions using the evidence. And I wouldn't need to care about the adults in the room. And uh, to my surprise, there are many adults in the room in academia who do not know the answer and therefore dismiss a lot of questions. And that's unfortunate. That's why I think young people have a much better chance of discovering new things because mm -hmm. they are not uh, carrying any baggage uh, and also because they're not so attached to their ego. Mm -hmm. And so I try to behave just like a kid. You can think of me as a farm boy asking difficult questions and trying to answer them uh, using evidence. Yeah, you you uh, you have this one saying that once I heard you um, uh, use it in the book and I've heard you use it in interviews, it's really stuck with me that science is uh, about evidence, not prejudice. Um, exactly. And, and, you know, it's very often said by uh, my colleagues uh, that the site... Uh, uh, Carl Sagan, he said, um, um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Mm -hmm. My point is, extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. Uh, <laughs> you know, we invested $10 billion in the Large Hadron Collider, uh, and uh, we searched for supersymmetric particles that may mm -hmm. make up most of the matter in the universe. We haven't found them. Uh, right. It's a search, but... Uh, we invested $1.1 billion in the LIGO experiment that discovered gravitational waves for the first time, and the Nobel Prize was awarded for that. Yeah. And without the investment of those funds, we would never discover gravitational waves. So my point is simple. You can't, on the one hand, claim we don't have extraordinary evidence and then decide not to fund the search. And the search that I'm talking about is really straightforward. It's a matter of common sense. We've sent equipment into space as a technological civilization. We know that half of the sun-like stars have a planet roughly the size of the Earth and mm -hmm. roughly at the same separation. So the conditions on Earth may be replicated in billions of other planets. And we know that most of the stars form billions of years before the sun. So it's quite likely that there was another technological civilization that sent equipment to space a billion years ago and over a billion years it could have populated the entire milky way galaxy and uh, whether we live in such a reality or not 
is easy to figure out. You know, it's not a philosophical question. We just need to use our telescopes and uh, look around. And, you know, it's just like um, sitting at home and, you know, some people sit at home and say, nobody is knocking on my door, therefore I don't have neighbors. Uh, that's what uh, Enrico Fermi said 70 years ago. He asked, where is everybody? Mm. And that became uh, Fermi's paradox about extraterrestrial. We don't, yeah. we don't see them and therefore they may not exist. My point is, in order to find them, you need to look through your windows, uh, you know, better right. with a telescope. And, you know, that's what uh, the Galileo project that I established about half a year ago is all about. Yeah, and just to dig in on that a little bit, because this is something that, look, granted, I'm I'm obviously just a just an enthusiast, right? So I have no, you know, um, no academic training whatsoever. I make video games, you know, and I I do movies and I do television shows. So I I'm a dreamer. So I have zero academic uh, basis. But if from what I have heard, or you know, because this is all really just you know leap of faith knowledge that I've accumulated, the the cosmic background radiation says that the universe is roughly about 14 billion years old, something like that, right? Now, uh, the planet Earth supposedly is around 4 billion years old, right? Four so one, one, one quick question for you, because that's, that's a pretty good percentage of the entire existence of the universe, as we know, right? right. Um, is, is the planet Earth in the context of the universe considered an ancient planet? Or is it middle of the road or is it young? Like, are there, were, was there enough time for hydrogen to turn into heavier elements for there to be planets that are much older than the earth? Uh, right. The yeah. So most of the stars form before the sun. We can monitor the star formation history of the universe. And um, most of the stars form before the sun. The sun is a late bloomer, so to speak. <laughs> uh, it might be that, uh, you know, in order for, to have intelligent life uh, the way we are, uh, you needed heavy elements, a lot of them, to be produced by earlier generations of stars. But even in that context, you know, time in the universe is measured in billions of years. And mm -hmm. it's very unlikely that all the intelligent civilizations formed exactly at the same time. So if you were to ask, OK, there is some spread in the formation times, uh, it's very likely there was another one uh, or many, <laughs> actually, uh, a billion years ago. And mm. if you ask me, I would say we are probably not the smartest kid on the block. Mm -hmm. Now, you tell me that you are a dreamer. Well, uh, I attended the, a month and a half ago, I attended the, a forum in the Washington National Cathedral uh, in which uh, Jeff Bezos was saying that he was inspired to invest in space tourism uh, by watching Star Trek as right. a kid. And yeah, I was yeah. uh, sitting next to Avril Haynes, the director of national intelligence. And uh, I told her, you know, I never liked Star Trek uh, as a kid <laughs> because it violated the laws of physics and it didn't look real to me. You know, I'm in love with reality. I really right. love reality. And when you love something, you want to know everything about it. And when it looks fake, you know, when that someone puts some makeup or looks unreal, you know, you can't enjoy that. So I'm really in love with reality and I couldn't, you know, enjoy Star Trek. So I told the Avril, you know, that wasn't my favorite thing. And she said, we have to work on you. And as it turns out, I'm supposed to speak with William Shatner, who oh, called wow. me shortly after I wrote about it. Um, and uh, we shall see how that conversation goes. But my point is, there is enough in reality itself to amaze us. We don't need fiction. Amen. Amen. Um, I um, I also get really encouraged by the idea that if you track life on the planet as much as we understand it today, it took the planet Earth about 3.5 billion years for there to be supposedly the first single cell, you know, uh, you know, organism, right? So somehow RNA and DNA and chicken or the egg, who knows what happened? Somehow a single cell was was born, and then it took you know, almost another five, 499,000, uh, I'm sorry, 499 million years for hominids, you know, to start walking around, right? And then once we came around, now we're sending, you know, the James Webb telescope into space. So it does seem that life has this exponential uh, uh, variable to it, that once it emerges, it speeds up at an exponential rate. So like a hundred years, 
is is more valuable than like the last you know hundred million that came before it. That's true, and the the question is what will happen in the coming centuries? Will we mm. survive? Because we are also uh, producing the means for our own destruction. We don't pay uh, attention to our environment. We develop technologies that could kill us. And uh, uh, we need to be careful about it. But um, the one thing that I'm reminded is we are born into this world like actors put on a stage. Mm. And we tend to think that the play is about us. So uh, the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle argued that we are at the center of the universe. And sure. you know, then it turned out to be wrong. We are not at the center of the stage. And that's what Copernicus and Galileo uh, showed us. And uh, then uh, we thought, oh, maybe the Earth-Sun system is unique. Turns out it's not. Uh, it's very common. Uh, now there are lots of people in academia still arguing that maybe we are the only intelligence out there. My mm. point is it's very unlikely. Uh, and everything around us is probably quite uh, common. Sure. And, and, you know, if we want to, we are clearly not at the center of the stage. The play is not about us because we only came at the end. We better look for other actors and right. ask them. Maybe they have a better sense of the meaning of this play and our place in it. My my personal feeling, again, you know, uh, you know, disclaimer. I'm just uh, an enthusiast. My personal feeling is that at the center, the the play is about gravity, um, because it seems that gravity is that one thing that when humanity kind of gets a slightly better understanding of it everything changes around them. You know, it, it, it seems to be the most productive insights that have happened to human beings are directly correlated to this beautiful concept of gravity. Yeah, de definitely. Gravity is, is very fundamental and we still don't understand how to unify gravity with quantum mechanics. Mm. If we will, uh, we might be able to uh, produce a baby universe in the laboratory. So sure. there is one question of how was our universe born? And perhaps it was born in the laboratory of an advanced <laughs> civilization. You can think of it as generations, right? That uh, people have babies and the babies have their own babies and so forth. And it's possible that a universe like ours makes technological civilizations that eventually reach the point where they can create baby universes. And that's how the Big Bang started. You know, and mm. um, the reason I bring this up is because a very advanced scientific civilization may be a good approximation to what religious scripts call sure. God in the past. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and if we ever meet technological relics of other civilizations that, that are far more advanced than we are, they might look like magic to us. And uh, uh, we should just be humble and modest as we search around, because when we find such a piece of technology, it will be just like a caveman finding a cell phone. And the caveman would say initially, the cell phone is a rock of a type that I've never seen before. Mm. But if the caveman is not curious, he will throw it away. The appropriate approach is to be curious and press buttons on this rock that you've just found that doesn't look like any rock you've seen before. And then you would realize that it records your voice, records your image, and then you would eventually understand that it's not a rock. Is it is it a possible theory that 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 gets socialized out there because when i hear about the concept of a singularity um that that you know the big bang started at this finite point and that black holes lead into a finite point and like like you just said a few minutes ago nothing in the universe is unique right everything comes in multiples is it possible that black holes are actually the almost the aperture of a big bang on the other side and that's how the multi like is that something that's socialized out there or considered it's definitely possible now a singularity is just uh, our admission that the uh, einstein's theory of gravity is incomplete mm -hmm. because it's a point in space or time where einstein's equations that describe gravity break down meaning mm -hmm. that they cannot be applied anymore. And you can understand it in the context of the Big Bang. If you go back in time, I mean, we know the universe is expanding. So going back in time, matter was denser and denser. And there is a point in time when the density was infinite. And then, you know, we don't know what happened because Einstein's theory breaks down. The sure. curvature of space and time becomes infinite. The same is true at the center of a black hole where there is a singularity of a different type. But in both cases, 
we don't know what happens and we know why we don't understand it because when you deal with very high density of energy or mass you need to incorporate quantum mechanics and right. uh, einstein's theory of gravity doesn't include quantum mechanics now how do you marry quantum mechanics and gravity into a single unified theory is a challenge that was not yet met sure. by many generations of physicists starting with einstein he wanted to solve that to crack that the unification problem yeah. but uh, it wasn't successful and today the you know over the past four decades there were a, a, a whole community of a thousand uh, physicists or or even more uh, called the string theories that attempted mm -hmm. that uh, we haven't yet uh, uh, arrived at uh, a single theory that can make predictions that we can test. And sure. so we don't have an answer for that. But it's clear that once we have a theory that unifies quantum mechanics and gravity, we'll figure out what's on the other end. And uh, to answer your question, it's possible that matter falling into a black hole singularity comes on the other side in a big bang. That's possible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's quite amazing. Do you think that just like when Newton started to understand um, and create predictions around gravity and motion. You know, we had this huge revolution of, of industry and then Einstein with his optimizing of that view, then we had atomic energy. Do you think that the next big step, and granted the LIGO thing almost just kind of proves what they were talking about to be, you know, to be real. Do you think that finding the graviton particle is that, next leap and do you think that that's even possible with the amount of energy that we can imagine creating to create those annihilations okay the graviton is is a gravitational wave it's basically mm. uh producing ripples in space and time um for example as a result of two black holes colliding with each other and that's what the ligo experiment uh, detected uh uh, about six years ago, and the, the Nobel Prize was awarded for that. So we already know that the graviton exists, but I think the real challenge is how to unify quantum mechanics uh, and gravity in a way that mm. would avoid these singularities that we were talking about. And that's something to, to be done in the future. Now, I have a hope, you know, in the past we did our physics um, using our scientists. You know, Einstein was a very celebrated uh, you know, scientists of the 20th century made a lot of important uh, insights. But uh, I think in the future, it's possible that the artificial intelligence systems will be fed with data and will mm -hmm. come with new insights. Now, the big advantage of AI scientists is that they will not be attached to their ego. They mm -hmm. will not, uh, uh, you know, when they see an object that doesn't look like a comet or an asteroid, they will admit that they would not pretend to be experts. And when they see that this object resembles another object that we have sent into space, the AI scientist would admit that. Mm. And the AI scientist is not uh, necessarily following honors or awards like real humans do. Um, and of course, uh, we can send AI astronauts into space rather than human astronauts. They would survive long journeys and uh, the hazardous conditions of space. So that's one aspect of science that I think uh, we will benefit from in the future that will accelerate the progress of knowledge. And the second is that, uh, you know, just like in a class, if you have a smarter kid next to you, uh, you might learn from that kid uh, mm -hmm. the answers to questions to which you don't know the answer to. And uh, it might feel like cheating in an exam, but, you know, if it takes us a million years to find the answer from another civilization that had those million years to think about it, so be it. I would like to know the answer. I don't care that, uh, you know, I don't want to go through a million years of us trying to ponder what the answer is. If they already figured it out, let's find out from them. Yeah, you had a very interesting anecdote in your book about a graduate student, I believe, in Harvard, a female, who had um, uh, uh, discovered a, a truth about um, something with the with the sun or something. But you, you use this example to prove that the very point that you're talking about, that we, we often have these massive delays in discovery and they're all based around human prejudice, you know? And is there, is there a solution for that? Or is that something we're just going to have to deal with because the, that part of human nature is just unsurmountable? Well, there is a solution. Uh, rather than pay attention to our ego, 
and uh, try to brag how smart we are, which is pretty much the motivation of a lot of people in academia. They want to get honors, awards, establish echo chambers around themselves with mm. students and postdocs that repeat their mantras and so forth. Instead of being motivated by that, let's just behave like kids. You know, when I look at an adult, I often look for the kid behind the, the adult and yes. sort of like the adult is the avatar of the kid. So the <laughs> looks at the, in the, you can think of it in the metaverse, the avatar is not the real person. Uh, it's uh, the way the person wants to look like. Sure. And uh, it may cost a lot of money actually <laughs> to produce that the image. Uh, it may cause a lot, uh, cost a lot of effort, you know, uh, but the point of the matter is that we are all fundamentally kids in, in the sense that we have, most of the things, most of the um, uh, truth is not uh, available to us. So we, we live in an ocean of ignorance. We have an island of knowledge in that ocean. And let's admit it. You know, when we don't know the answer, whether we are the smartest kid on our cosmic block, let's admit that and search for evidence of other kids in our neighborhood. You know, my daughters, when they were young, they thought that they are the center of the world. And that notion changed when they went to the kindergarten. Sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I am. Um, it's very interesting that that you call your project the Galileo project because famously Galileo was forced to have basic house arrest, you know, for his life just for just for you know talking the truth, talking the observational data that he saw when he looked at the stars. And you know, look, that's something that we see a lot today, right? There's there's the scientists and doctors. You know, I'm not even going to say the name because maybe I'll get banned. But there's doctors that get banned off of major social platforms that are supposedly being run by forward thinking uh, young people because they just don't agree with what they're saying out of some weird prejudice. And then that prejudice changes week to week. And then what's bannable today is not bannable yesterday. And we have so much history showing the same exact pattern. It's frustrating to me that we don't understand that it's OK to be wrong. And it's okay to, you know, to admit it. Yeah, that's an excellent point because, uh, you know, if you look, uh, I mean, at Galileo's case, if he were alive today, he would have been canceled on social media. <laughs> and the point is, if you were to ask those philosophers at the time of Galileo that put him in house arrest, they clearly were popular, they had power. Right, and they were righteous, were, they were virtuous. Yeah, but if you were to ask them to design uh, a rocket that will reach Mars they would get it wrong because they thought that everything moves around the earth. Right. And that's the wrong idea about reality. So my point is, you know, you can live in the multi in, in the metaverse. You, uh, you know, there is an infinite world of possible virtual realities mm -hmm. and you can choose the ones that flatter your ego. For mm -hmm. example, Good choose point. the virtual reality where you are at the center of the universe. You can, and that's what these philosophers chose. And it's very uh, pleasurable. And a lot of people subscribe to that virtual reality at the time. But once you try to do something in the actual reality that we all share, like mm. sending a rocket to Mars, the real Mars, not the Mars in the <laughs> uh, metaverse, then you will get it wrong because you have the wrong concept of reality, the actual reality that we all share. And that's really what I'm talking about, that in order for us to uh, admit the constraints that we live in, in the actual reality. I mean, we can believe in ideas that flatter our ego, but, but if we want to operate in the actual reality that we live in physically, then we need to understand it. And just being liked on Twitter is not a sufficient condition for that because what you need to figure out is, are we alone? You know, the mm -hmm. fact that a lot of people say, yeah, we are the smartest, doesn't make it true. You will not get rid of your neighbors by not looking through the windows. Sure. Yeah. So, so um, I want to travel back to October, 2017 uh, and maybe I have the story wrong, but is it, is it true that you were actually in Hawaii during the actual discovery of Oumuamua? A few months earlier, um, we visited the, uh, the observatory on uh, Mount Haleakala uh, in Maui uh, mm -hmm. where um the Panstars telescope is that discovered Oumuamua, this object, but it discovered it 
in uh, on October 19th, and we visited in early July uh, together with the director of that observatory. I gave a, a lecture there, uh, and we of course were not aware of uh, the the fact that there is an object that was actually closer. Uh, to the sun at that time than mm. uh, it was when it was discovered. Uh, and then in October, it was discovered. And the reason I was intrigued by this object is because a decade earlier, I wrote the first paper that forecasts how many rocks we expect from other stars to visit our solar system. Yeah. And we didn't expect that telescope in Hawaii to, the, to discover any uh, by orders of magnitude. And then it found this one. So that was intriguing. And I was uh, surprised by the fact. So that it was discovered, but then it started showing uh, properties that are not uh, similar to the objects, the rocks we have seen before in the solar system. And initially, the astronomers called it a comet, but there was no cometary tail. There was no evaporation of um, uh, water or dust from mm -hmm. its surface as it got close to the sun, the way comets evaporate. And it was, of course, natural to assume that it's a comet because these are the most loosely bound objects to the solar system. These are rocks covered with ice at the periphery of the solar system. And you can imagine the same thing in, uh, around other stars. And they, these kind of objects will be, because they are loosely bound to their host star, they can be easily dislodged by another star passing nearby. So one would expect most of the objects from interstellar space to be comets. And this one was not a comet. And then as it was tumbling around, uh, the amount of sunlight reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. And that mm -hmm. meant that it has a very extreme shape. Uh, and the best fit yeah. to the variation of light was that of a pancake, uh, a flat shape, very unusual. And then it was pushed away from the sun uh, by some mysterious force. Uh, that declined inversely with distance squared. And the only explanation I could think of is a reflection of sunlight is pushing it, sort of like a sail being pushed by the wind, except that nature doesn't make such things uh, that are thin um, and can be reflected by, uh, pushed by reflecting sunlight. And uh, so I suggested maybe it's artificial. Uh, yeah. And of course, uh, uh, many of my colleagues had a problem with that, but I should say that in September 2020, there was another object discovered by the same telescope right. that exhibited the same qualities. It was given the name 2020 SO, and it was pushed by reflecting sunlight and also didn't have a cometary tail. And then the astronomers realized that it actually was sent from Earth in 1966. It's a rocket right. that had very thin walls, and we produced it. So it's clearly artificial. And the question is, who produced Oumuamua, the first object? And um, just just to backtrack a little bit, because it's something that I learned recently that, you know, when 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 objects are discovered um, in space by these um, you know telescopes, they're classified as either C X number or a X number, which means uh, comet or asteroid. And this was the first ever I X number, as in it's, it's an object from interstellar space. Um, and it's the first one that 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 we know of. Am I correct in saying that? Yes, it was the first discovered the size of a football field. Prior to this uh, discovery, we just didn't have a survey telescope that was sensitive to the light reflected from an object the size of a football field uh, flying within the orbit of the Earth around the sun. So this was really the first time that we could detect such objects. And there might be many more that are smaller than this object flying through or moving much faster so we don't notice them. And uh, it really opens a window for a completely new population mm. of interstellar objects. And it's quite remarkable that the first one we discovered looks so unusual, uh, so weird. And I should say that the astronomers initially called it a comet. It was sure. later given the name interstellar object. Yeah. The the um, the it's funny because if you look up um, a muamua on on Wikipedia, right, the very first sentence, and I should probably read the exact sentence, but I'm I'm doing it off the top of my mind here. The very first sentence is that it's a it's it's not a very luminous object, right? It's like literally the first sentence they used to describe it. Um, but when I hear or read you talk about the data that you guys accumulated over those few months that you were able to track it is that it, it in fact went from dark to 10x uh, luminous so it, it was actually far brighter 
than than many of the things that that we find out there. But yet, the story that is told in the mainstream is that it was actually not a very luminous object. Well, actually, um, I saw the first email from the discovery team, and it said this is a very unusual object. And uh, when uh, we heard the lecture about it at Harvard, uh, and I left the room together with a colleague of mine who was uh, working uh, on rocks in the solar system for decades, he said, Oumuamua is so weird, I wish it never existed. <laughs> and uh, to me, that illustrates the fact that experts always want to be able to explain anything we see. Right. And uh, just like the cavemen would argue, you know, it's a rock of a type we've never seen before. And in fact, these were the explanations that my uh, colleagues in the mainstream proposed. They suggested maybe it's a hydrogen iceberg, maybe sure. it's a chunk of frozen nitrogen, maybe it's a cloud of dust particles. These are things we've never seen before, and they, they had to invent them in order to explain the anomalous properties of this object. And I say, you know, if it's something we've never seen before, perhaps it's artificially made. And uh, it's the first object uh, from another civilization that we spotted. Yeah, and, and you know, um, you you collected a bunch of different um, um, traits about this particular object that when you sort of multiply them together, made it a one in a million type of of discovery and one of the things that that kind of really convinced you that this was very 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 strange and potentially started thinking of the of the theory that it could be artificial was the fact that it went around uh, the sun and sped up now i want to play for you a quick video uh from somebody that i respect a lot who i've interviewed before have done documentaries with and i consider a brilliant mind neil degrasse tyson talking about this object to the world, and I'm going to play the clip of you know for you very very quickly here. Oh, the reason why it's probably not aliens is its trajectory around the sun was completely determined by gravitational forces. How do you know? Because we know we calculate this. We have this laws of gravity, laws well, look, of look physics. At this, look at this. See this? So that that was his point on it. Now is that? True? Were, were, was the path predictable through the gravitational forces? No, it's not true. He must have made this statement before a, a paper appeared in Nature showing that there is this additional force acting on Oumuamua that pushed it away from the sun and declined inversely with distance squared. And it couldn't have been as a result of the standard evaporation of a comet because we haven't seen the cometary tail. And the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply for carbon-based molecules around mm -hmm. this object and couldn't find them. So I think this statement was made, made by Neil deGrasse Tyson before it was realized that, in fact, it's not following a path just shaped by the force of gravity of the sun. And so this statement is incorrect. But uh, my point is, we can figure out the truth. It's not a philosophical question. Exactly. And the key would be to date the next Oumuamua. It's just like going on a date with someone yet that really intrigues you, but that someone is already far away. You can't really find that person. And then you are thinking about how to date the next person that looks like it. And the, the Galileo project that uh, I established uh, in July 2021 as a result of very generous donations uh, to my research fund at Harvard is uh, aiming to obtain a high-resolution image of the next object that would look like Oumuamua mm. uh, through a space mission when, once we identify such an object. And that's one branch of the Galileo project. The second branch is to try and figure out the nature of those unidentified aerial phenomena that were reported to the U.S. Congress and mm -hmm. that a new office in government will be established to document the evidence about them uh, starting June uh, 2022. So uh, this is becoming a, a subject that the government cares about quite a bit. And uh, I think it's the duty of scientists to figure out the answer because it may not be a matter of national security. It may be an international matter that uh, appeal, appeals to all humans on Earth. 1, and the way to figure it out is using the scientific method. So we are actually putting together a telescope system on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory in the coming mm -hmm. months. Uh, and once it operates to our satisfaction, it will be sensitive in the infrared, visible light, 
radio, uh, audio, um, and once it satisfies uh, the requirements, we will make copies of it and put them in many locations and monitor the sky because the sky is not classified. It's only data obtained by government-owned sensors that is classified because the sensors are classified. So it's about time for a scientific exploration of this, and that's what the Galileo project is all about. Plus, of course, trying to get a picture of objects like Oumuamua because a picture is worth a thousand words. And in my case, it's worth 66,000 words, <laughs> words in my book, Extraterrestrial. I yeah. would never write this book if I had an image of Oumuamua. It would look either like a nitrogen iceberg, hydrogen iceberg, a dust bunny, or an object that has bolts and screws on it and some buttons that we can press. Right. And if it's the latter, I would really love to press one of these buttons. And how, how, for how many months were we collecting active data on Oumuamua? Like, is, is, were you able to see all of the data collected um, yes. throughout, throughout the process? Yes, I was able to uh, see it and analyze it. The only problem is that astronomers thought, oh, it's uh, either an asteroid or a comet. And therefore, uh, we didn't collect as much data as we could have collected. And so... Uh, it was collected roughly over a period of uh, two weeks, mostly, but mm. we could have uh, monitored it for uh, twice or three times that long with more telescopes. And that's what will happen uh, when we find the next Oumuamua. Is and there regret then, about that? That that like, is there is there a consensual regret amongst the scientific community that they didn't pay enough attention to it while we had the opportunity, or is it something that people don't really care about? No. Uh, a lot of people care about it, and the evidence for that is um, that the, the James Webb Space Telescope was just launched, and yep. the, there is already a proposal to uh, have time on it to observe the next interstellar object when it shows up and mm -hmm. uh, study it much more carefully than we did uh, with Oumuamua. So obviously everyone is uh, alerted to the interest in this subject. Right. But uh, uh, most of the mainstream argues that we should not engage in discussions about extraterrestrial equipment, that it's uh, something that should be left out of the discussion. And I don't understand that because the yeah, public cares a lot about it. And, the, the, you know, this, if we engage in this possibility, uh, we can bring more funds to science. I demonstrated it with the Galileo project. I got money that was not previously allocated to scientific projects. And moreover, we, we can bring new talent to science, those young kids that are really excited about this question. And rather than, uh, you know, uh, uh, putting a stigma on this subject and ridiculing it, I think we should celebrate it. It's something everyone cares about and the scientific method can be used to clear it up. And, you know, if we find that we are not the smartest kid on the block, you know, that would have huge implications uh, mm -hmm. for our future uh, as the human species. 1000%. And so taking it out of the solar system and into our stratosphere, how how are you applying the scientific method to whatever data you've been able to collect over these kind of TikTok style, you know, UFOs that have been, you know, observed by, you know, naval uh, pilots and, uh, you know, and and like you said, you know, the, the government has released these documents saying that there are supposedly things that they cannot explain that fly at speeds that we cannot explain that do not emit all, all the stuff that we already know. How do you approach the, that data? And is there anything interesting, any theories that you have come up with about that data? Yeah, so that data is not of good quality. It, mm. it includes blurry images. And we don't know what the cameras were doing in the cockpit of a you know jittery airplane and uh, so we, we really cannot uh, tell what uh, the instruments were and how uh, what their properties were and uh, what were they doing at the time that the data was collected. And uh, moreover, eyewitness testimonies cannot be used in scientific research. You have to use instruments over which you have full control and you fully understand how they operate. That's how the Galileo project plans to do the business. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, we are designing our observatories so that they would be optimized. We are not talking about equipment that was designed for a battlefield that 
by chance saw something strange. We sure. will design our uh, instruments and telescopes such that they will get us the very best quality data that we can get and in a way that we fully understand and our data will be open and transparent. The government-owned data is mostly classified. Mm -hmm. And so the only reason I'm intrigued by it is not so much by the data that was released. It's by the response of uh, people that I respect with integrity, such as former CIA directors, uh, Brennan and Woolsey, uh, former director of national intelligence, um, uh, and uh, you know former President Barack Obama. Um, and uh, uh, all of these people spoke about it as a serious matter, including Bill Nelson, the head of NASA, who argued that scientists should engage in figuring out the nature of these objects. So because these people saw the some of the classified data, mm -hmm. I haven't seen it, uh, and they talk about it seriously. Because of that, um, I decided to try and get scientific quality data and figure it out using the scientific method. And we plan to make the data open and publish scientific papers on it. Uh, and uh, until recently, there was no such uh, study. And, and as a result, the public was speculating. The scientific community was ridiculing any discussion. And that was mm -hmm. not a healthy situation. Sure. Um, and I think we uh, should expect exciting things to come because uh, one way or, or another, it's a fishing expedition. We will mm -hmm. report on all the fish that we catch. Sure. And of course, in the past, you know, people may have used fishing nets that have big holes in them. So they missed <laughs> a lot of fish. Uh, right. We might catch new fish. And, you know, just like Robert Frost said that there were two roads in the woods and he chose the one that was not taken. Right. The one uh, that's that made all the difference. For yeah. me, the biggest difference is there is a chance we will pick low hanging fruit because nobody took the path that we are taking. Now, are you guys planning on having a single observatory or a network of observatories to kind of, like like you said, to use the analogy of the net, uh, for it to go through a network of observatories? Or is it a single one to start and then you hopefully will grow from there? No, we need hundreds of them hundreds. to cover enough of the sky based on the statistics of uh, reports that came in the past. And for that, we need about $100 million, which is not a lot by any measure of scientific projects you know it's yeah we just got to get a couple of nfts going and then we'll uh we'll exactly we'll, we'll raise the money <laughs> yeah and, and i i can guarantee to whoever funds us that uh, any data we get will be data from the real uh reality the actual reality we all share the physical yeah. reality and not um, a, 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 any um you know from the the metaverse um, yeah. But uh, the other thing is, um, currently we have about $2 million from donations, and that's sufficient to make maybe five to ten uh, copies of the first system that we will put on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory. So we already have some that's head start, awesome. but uh, we really seek funding at a larger level so that we can accomplish the task. And we will uh, share the data with uh, whoever funds us and with uh, the entire scientific community. So it will be a completely tr transparent analysis and using the scientific method. And we don't have a prejudice. We don't have an agenda. Uh, we will just let everyone know what we find. Yeah. It, you know, th this actually just just you speaking um, reminds me of something in your book um, that there's this kind of marginalized point of view towards kind of SETI driven experimentation. Um, I believe that that's how you worded it, but that in the recent um, years that you've actually seen an uptick of doctoral theses um, at your university around SETI style uh, questions. Um, yeah, but, uh, but the uptick was rather modest. Right. I'm talking about, you know, for example, uh, an increase in funding by thousands because right now you know um, a, a couple of weeks ago president biden signed into law the defense bill and the defense budget is basically the amount of money that the nation decides to allocate in order to protect itself from adversaries sure. okay um, and uh, just uh, think about the possibility that the galileo project will discover extraterrestrial equipment that may change the perspective it's just like realizing sure. that we are in a playground you know of a kindergarten and there is a world out there that is far bigger and more important right or we are used to and 
then suppose the politicians say, okay, well, that's a serious matter and we should allocate uh, similar amounts of funds or even more to studying our bigger environment, okay? Instead of playing in, the, in, in, in this playground with, you know, worrying about what other nations are doing uh, or endangering us in some way or another. Um, and the, so imagine that a trillion dollars would be allocated per year for this question. And, you know, that's thousands of times more than the amount of money allocated to big science projects because sure. you know, the James Webb Space Telescope got $10 billion. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider also got $10 billion over decades. Uh, and it was a collaboration of many nations. And that's thousands of times less budget, less money than uh, the defense bill. And so just imagine a trillion dollar a year for this question. What can we do with it? Well, first thing is we can build much better, bigger, better telescopes that would give us more information than the Galileo project can assemble. So basically making the Galileo project on a bigger scale. And then the second thing we can do is send uh, equipment to space equipped with uh, artificial intelligence that will, these are probes that explore our cosmic environment and will fly close to objects like Oumuamua or go farther out and, and seek uh, evidence. And finally, we need to think about reorganizing our society because if we know that there is a smarter kid on our block, it mm. will change a lot of things for us. Do you think it'll change things for us in a positive way or do you think that that's the eminent kind of danger is that people will start to panic because it'll throw religious beliefs into question and all the, you know, the typical things that have happened to us since we became quote unquote civilized is that anything that questions our kind of theology is, is deemed as something that's very dangerous and panic will ensue. Do, do you have those same types of concerns or do you think humanity once it knows the truth will, you know, kind of uh, coalesce and sort of get down with it? Well, I'm an optimist and I don't think that uh, we did very well in history because if you look at human history, you see over and over again, uh, groups of people trying to feel superior relative to other people. And the yes. best example is Nazi, the Nazi regime that mm -hmm. triggered the death of 75 million people. That was 3% of the world population in 1940. Right. Uh, and it's 10 times more than the number of deaths triggered by COVID-19. Uh, that's right. remarkable. A group of people deciding to feel superior killed 10 times more people back in 1940 than uh, COVID-19 so far. Right, right. If, uh, if you think about it, if you find that we there is a smarter kid on our block, cosmic block, then it would uh, make all the differences among humans meaningless. And uh, perhaps that will bring us to our senses uh, such that we will treat each other uh, with respect as equal members of the human species. Mm -hmm. So I really hope that it will change the way we think about ourselves, make us more modest, more humble, and, um, you know, as, as uh, the human species, unite us. That's my hope. But, you know... It's hard to tell how things will turn out. And I don't think, by the way, that the risk is from religions because um, um, a lot of religious people tell me that, you know, they, they are comfortable with the notion that we might not be the, the only uh, sure. species, intelligent species out there. And moreover, if I think about space exploration, you know, uh, there is no business plan to living the solar system. You cannot make money out of living the solar system. Right. But on the other hand, uh, it connects to spirituality. You ask questions about what's beyond. And uh, as a result, you know, I think that uh, finding evidence for what's beyond uh, may actually give us some spiritual meaning to our life. And uh, it will not be in conflict with religious belief necessarily. And this, that, that's actually a really nice segue to something I wanted to chat with you about, which is that you're also involved in a, in a, in a startup, I believe, called Starshot. Uh, am I saying that correctly? Yeah. And, um, yeah. It's a research project. It's not a, a, a startup. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. A, a venture-backed research project. And the mission of that project is, um, is what? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, back in uh, 2015, um, an entrepreneur from Silicon Valley named uh, Yuri Milner um, came out of a black limousine next to the Center for Astrophysics <laughs> at Harvard and, 
entered my office and sat on the sofa in front of me and asked me whether I'm willing to lead a project that will contemplate a mission to visit the nearest star within our lifetime. Sure. So he's the same age as I am, and it, it meant uh, within 20 years reaching the nearest star. And I knew that the, that star is four light years away. So, uh, you know, th this uh, spacecraft needs to travel at a fifth of the speed of light, which is a thousand times faster than chemical rockets. Mm. And uh, I told him I need six months to think it through. Mm. And then uh, with my students and postdocs, we came up with the concept that uh, the only technology that can do that is by pushing uh, a very lightweight uh, sail with a powerful laser beam. And that's what the project is about. And uh, we announced it in the company of uh, Stephen Hawking. And, um, and now we, uh, there are various groups working on components of this technology, like the laser, uh, the light sail. Uh, and we are not there yet. We haven't yet convinced ourselves that it's feasible in the immediate future, but we are working on it. And, and, and theoretically speaking, the, the laser shoots um, uh, away from the vessel. So it's using both laser and a solar sail concept. No, the, the, the sun is too faint uh, to push uh, a sail close to the speed of light. I mean, uh, the only way you can do that is if you are parking a light sail near a massive star that is about to explode. And when the star explodes, <laughs> there is a flash of light that is so powerful that it could push a light sail of the type that I, we are talking about in the context of uh, Starshot. Uh, it could bring it close to the speed of light. So that's the only way to get it uh, from a natural sure. source of light. But, but the sun itself is not sufficiently bright. And so the laser is basically producing so much light per unit area that it, it uh, provides enough pressure, radiation pressure or force on the sail mm -hmm. and pushes it. And it, it, in the same way that a wind pushes the sail on a boat, uh, Got it. basically the uh, particles that make up the air that bounce off the walls of, of that sail uh, give it a push. And in, in the same way, particles of light that bounce off a light sail give it a push. Got it. It's like my dad, I think once when I was a kid, he tried to build a sailboat out of a canoe and he tried to put a fan on on the canoe to like throw wind at the sail. So it's kind of that same concept, but with light versus, you know, something like like a little tiny fan. That's right. Now, uh, uh, if you want to understand, for example, how airplanes are propelled, the, the principle is similar to a comet. Uh, basically, right. uh, you throw away material from uh, the engine backwards, and that pushes your jet plane forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, I once, uh, you know, when I was much younger on a, on a long flight, I, I did the calculation. It works out. You know, you, you can calculate how much material you need to throw back so that your your airplane will move forward in the speed that, that it moves because they show it on, on, on the screen in, in, in front of you as a passenger what the speed is. And I, I, I did the calculation. It makes sense with the fuel that they put on the plane. And so a comet does exactly the same thing. There is ice on the surface of the rock that evaporates and it gives it the rocket effect. A rocket, you know, is also propelled in the same way. Material is thrown backwards and then the rocket, what's re what remains from the rocket is pushed forward. Now, the concept of Starshot is different. You don't carry the fuel with you and uh, you, you're not throwing mm. back material. Uh, the laser is coming from um, somewhere else and it's pushing that sail and that makes the sail very oh, light. So the laser is not actually on the vessel. It's no. external to the vessel. It's on the ground. And that, oh, that is okay. a great advantage because then... Um, you can have a very light weight, uh, a sail that weighs just a few grams um, without carrying the need to carry any fuel. And it's being pushed by reflecting light. Right. And it won't, its course won't be obstructed until it meets another object that can actually deviate it from its course. Right. So it's sort of like a bullet that uh, you shoot uh, in the direction that you want. And you will not shoot it, for example, if you want to get to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, uh, you will not shoot it at the position where the star is right now, but when it, it would be at the time that this light sail reaches that point. 
And uh, so you have to forecast where Proxima Centauri will be. And the reason Proxima Centauri is interesting is there is a planet in the habitable zone around it. Uh, mm. This is the star, a star that is 12% of the mass of the sun. So it's much fainter than the sun. Mm. And it, uh, the temperature on the surface of this star is half that of, on the surface of the sun. So it emits mostly infrared light. And if there are any creatures on the surface of that planet, yeah. they must have infrared eyes. Yeah, and the planet is so close to the star that um, it has uh, it is tidally locked. It always faces the star with the same side at all times. It has a permanent day side and a permanent night side. And if there is any civilization there, you might think that they would like to put photovoltaic cells on the day side and uh, get electricity to produce light on the night side. The uh, but my daughters say that if we ever go there, they would like to live on the strip that separates. The <laughs> the this way you can sit on the porch and watch the sunset forever. The sun right. never sets. Right. No, no, that's amazing. Um, you you had mentioned before a little bit about the business plan of, uh, of sort of extra terrestrial exploration. Um, and um, this is kind of, you know, one of my sort of fantasies, but I remember reading a while back that I forget if it's Uranus or Neptune or one of those two planets that they believe that a big portion of the planet is actually diamond. Is that is this is this a true thing? Like, uh, like, have you ever heard about, about this? Um, well, uh, we we haven't yet seen for sure a planet made mostly of carbon, but people have conjectured that. Yeah. Um, um, you know the. Um, one of the most distant uh, um, uh, objects that we visited recently was with the New Horizons mission, uh, Pluto. Mm -hmm. And uh, I should say that I'm embarrassed by the fact that we sent the New Horizons probe. Not so much that the probe was sent, but, but NASA decided to put on the probe 30 grams of the ashes of Clyde Tambow, the sun scientist that discovered uh, who discovered Pluto. And the, the reason it's embarrassing is because ashes are just burned up DNA. You take mm -hmm. the genetic information of a person and destroy it, burn it up. And it's no different than the ashes of a cigarette. Sure. And the, NASA put it on the spacecraft to commemorate Clyde Tambow. But if another uh, civilization, if uh, some extraterrestrials find the, the, this box of ashes on board New Horizons, you know, they would ask themselves, what are these primitive rituals that uh, <laughs> uh, rather uh, not so intelligent civilization is practicing because they want to commemorate a scientist who discovered an object and they do it by destroying any information about the scientist mm -hmm. and they put it in a box. Now, uh, I actually asked this question, uh, uh, I asked the, the principal investigator of that mission, Alan Stern, and uh, I asked him, why didn't you send, for example, a stem cell from the body of Clyde Tambow? Or right. uh, why didn't you put the, the information in electronic form? And he said that it would have been a bureaucratic nightmare to put a biological part of, of, of uh, Tambow's body. But my point is, we should probably right. send, we should probably send a spacecraft that will overtake New, New Horizons so that we don't give a bad impression <laughs> uh, a civilization out there uh, we should send something that shows more intelligence and you know there may be a committee out there in the milky way galaxy that decides whether the sun has an intelligent civilization next to it and my guess is so far they have decided we, we are not intelligent yeah it, look it, um do you think that there's um ethical reasons for putting dna in space um, i don't see any but yeah, so I actually think that our future in space is with AI astronauts, uh, yeah. not with humans, because we were selected by Darwinian evolution to survive on the surface of this Earth. Sure. Um, and if you want to send uh, astronauts to long journeys that would last millions of years through space under harsh conditions, bombardment by cosmic rays and other uh, hazardous conditions and you know in, in vacuum and you know illuminated by x-rays and so forth it's better to send the uh, electronic equipment and uh, and by the way uh, ai systems are driving cars now and they can yeah. process much more data than the human brain can and 
I would actually trust them. I would be proud of AI astronauts. And I think that's what we should aim to send. So sending DNA is not really something we should be proud of because I think in the future we should be proud of our technological kids, our you know, AI astronauts. And if we can contemplate such a future, someone else might have done it. That's another reason to look for AI astronauts sent by other civilizations. So AI yeah. astronauts, um, I love that. The book is Extraterrestrial, First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth, Avi Loeb, Dr. Avi Loeb. I, I'm so humbled that you've um, given me your time and your brilliance and uh, have spoken a little bit to the metaverse and, and you know the folks um, that are obsessed with living in virtual reality. Oh, it reminds me, last thing. You had mentioned before that you had done some um, some some research and some workings into virtual reality. What what's your overall kind of high concept take on all that stuff? I, I I was very intrigued by that comment, and I I don't want to hang up until I hear your thoughts on that really quick. Right. So um, you know the the world of possible realities is infinite. You know, and usually the problem is that uh, humans tend to. Uh, like those realities that flatter their ego. And, you know, uh, when people get married in the metaverse, they can have uh, much better looks than they have in the real world. Right, and, right. Uh, we can uh, always choose a reality that flatters us. And my problem is that uh, at the end of the day, we live within the reality that we all share. And yes. we better... Uh, be aware of that. As a scientist, that's what I'm trying to do, collect evidence about. I mean, we can enjoy the metaverse as a game or as a, uh, as long as we are aware that there is an actual reality out there. And, uh, you know, so for me, um, it's fun to be in the metaverse, but um, I'm really in love with reality the way it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, you know, the metaverse is not an in, a new invention because over history, you know, humans believed in ideas that had nothing to do with reality. And, you know, we used, uh, some people put cosmetic makeup and that's a sure. change in the way they look. Mount uh, Olympus. Uh, yeah. And uh, so it's nicer to believe in, in a reality that has cosmetic makeup and people look nicer. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, people uh, are taking uh, recreational drugs, the illusional drugs, and they uh, face something that is not the actual reality that we all share um and uh, you know so uh, uh, over time uh, there were lots of ideas and there were you know people believing that we are the center of the universe and people believing that um you know in in that there is life after death all kinds of ideas my point is i you know i have no problem with that except that if we want to make progress in adapting to the actual neighborhood that we live in you know we need to look through our windows we need to figure out who the neighbors are we need to uh, pay attention to the actual reality because that's the only way we will learn something new and then adapt to it and you know it's possible that uh, you uh, Enrico Fermi asked where is everybody it's possible that they put goggles of virtual reality all these extraterrestrials <laughs> And they don't engage with us because right. of that. They enjoy themselves in the metaverse, and that's pretty much it. And uh, if that's the explanation for Fermi's paradox, I would be very disappointed. Yeah, no, that's a that's a beautiful thought to uh, leave the podcast with. Again, Doctor Avi Loeb, thank you so much, and um, I look forward to um, to more work from you. I look forward to seeing what happens with the Galileo project, and hopefully. On Starshot, you know, we can find some of that diamond in Neptune or something and, you know, and, and end world hunger. But anyway, thank you so much, sir. I'm going to be signing off now. Thank you to all who listen and we'll be seeing you soon. Thank you for hosting me.